Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. It was a warm summer night when Julie Davis was packing up her Des Moines office. The 33-year-old was excited. She'd be moving out of the business park and into a high-rise building downtown. Unfortunately, she would never make it there. The crime was shocking and frustrating, her killer having left behind little to suggest a motive or an identity. While police worked to try and crack the case, they also knew it wasn't going to be easy. Over the next six months, police would respond to three other murders in the area which shared some similarities to Julie's. The public began asking, was there a serial killer stalking the streets of Des Moines and its nearby cities? Officers couldn't say yes, but they couldn't say no either. Three years later, investigators arrested and charged a man with one of those murders, and subsequently, another. While evidence had been discovered linking him to the two crimes, police began trying to connect him to Julie. Had she fallen victim to the same killer? Or was it, as some believed, that the mother of two had likely been killed by someone she knew and trusted? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 146, The Murder of Julie Bell Davis. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we'll examine a horrifying unsolved murder. But before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon available at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions there or directly email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. A young, successful, happily married mother of two posts her best sales month yet and is preparing to move into a much nicer office. Then, in a moment of madness, a vicious killer strikes, taking away everything she'd ever fought for. This is episode 146, The Murder of Julie Bell Davis. It was a hot summer night in downtown Des Moines as the sun swept over the river and began its descent towards the horizon. Towering buildings cast elongated shadows to the east, enveloping the dozen or so brown cement buildings which comprised the River Hills Business Park. While many of the companies housed in the complex had shut down operations for the day, at least one woman was still hard at work. 33-year-old Julie Bell Davis was excited. She'd recently convinced her boss to move her office from the park into a downtown high-rise. Just a few days earlier, she'd signed the new lease, tucked it into an envelope, and dropped it in the mail for her boss to look over while she was packing everything up in preparation. While dozens of businesses occupied space in the complex, few were even aware of Julie. Most of the time, she worked out of the main hub in Cedar Rapids, only coming to Des Moines twice a week for a few hours a day to meet potential clients who'd scheduled appointments. The rest of the time, the space was dark and appeared vacant. Even employees working in the office next door were unaware of Julie's presence, though they had noticed the van she was packing, parked in the back alley service area a few times that week. Julie had made the two-hour trek from Cedar Rapids that morning, wanting to get as much done at the office as she could, but as the parking lot was slowly emptying, she remained inside. At approximately 7 p.m., an acquaintance decided to stop by and see how things were going. As he exited his car and approached the rear entrance, he noticed something strange. 
The heavy door, which would typically swing shut, automatically locking behind anyone entering or exiting, was slightly ajar. Peering through the few inches of open space, the man called out for Julie, but was answered only by silence. Pulling the door open, he didn't make it far before his heart leapt into his throat. There, in a back storage room, Julie lay motionless on the concrete floor, and there was blood everywhere. Panicked and unsure of what to do, he ran out of the building to call 911. Moments later, the dark alley was painted in shades of red and blue as police arrived. Almost from the first moment investigators stepped inside, they knew the answers would not come easily. Julie Renee Bell was born on December 31, 1963, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to parents Robert and Joanne. Julie was the second born, having an older brother, Christopher. A few years later, the Bell family would welcome a second son, Timothy. Anytime anyone has been asked to describe Julie, there are several words which frequently come up. Brilliant, sweet, caring, hardworking, and dedicated. There honestly isn't a great deal of information available about Julie's early life. Her family have been fairly reserved when it comes to discussing her. However, over the years, many people have spoken about how kind she was, the type of person who would help anyone out at the drop of a hat if they needed it. Julie was a bright student. Her name appears on the honor roll listings multiple times. In 1982, during her senior year at Prairie High School, Julie was enrolled in German language classes and was selected as one of eight students who would take a two-week tour of the country. She was also a religious woman, being an active member of the church and volunteering to assist in Sunday school classes. She would later go on to volunteer for the McLeod Academy, an alternative school that was focused on providing better options for students and their families who felt their public school was not delivering the education or opportunities they hoped for. In her early 20s, Julie would begin a relationship with Frank Davis. The two were clearly head over heels for one another, and at the age of 23, Julie married Frank in September of 1987. At the time of their nuptials, Julie was listed as being employed by the Norrand Corporation, while Frank was a recent graduate of a local technical college and was employed in Norrand Service Center. Frank would later go on to become a firefighter in Cedar Rapids. By all accounts, their relationship was an extremely happy one, and over the course of the next years, the couple would begin building their life in Cedar Rapids, ultimately moving into a home on Meadow Glen Street in the city of Marion, a part of the Cedar Rapids metropolitan area. A few years later, Julie became a mother for the first time, giving birth to a son. She had always been devoted to family, but becoming a mother made that connection even stronger. Her devotion was bolstered two years later when she and Frank welcomed their second son. While Julie's family was growing, so was her career. In the late 80s, she began working for trade show marketing and later Skyline Display. The Houston-based company was owned and operated by Kevin Eagleton, who would describe Julie to the Des Moines Register, saying, quote, she was young, energetic, very bright, very hardworking. She had a very successful career in this business. She was a very good employee. End quote. Julie, it seemed, had a true gift for marketing and sales, and that, coupled with her driven and determined approach, would lead to many lucrative deals. Sadly, just as Julie seemed to be approaching the pinnacle of her success, the unthinkable would happen. It was the summer of 1997, and Julie was 33 years old. July proved to be an extremely fruitful month for the mother of two, as she had her best sales month to date. Rolling into August, Julie was looking forward to raising the bar even higher. Based out of the company's Cedar Rapids office, where she worked with four other full-time employees, her main territory was to the west, in central Iowa and Des Moines. Julie was, in fact, the only person who ever worked out of the River Hills Business Park satellite office, two hours from home, and even then, she'd only be there once or twice a week. According to Eagleton, that office was only for appointments. Describing it to the Gazette, he explained, quote, 
Usually, they would make an appointment in advance to come by and meet with Julie. It's not the type of business where you get walk-in traffic. End quote. In the early part of August, Julie had discussions with Eagleton regarding moving out of the River Hills Business Park into a smaller, albeit nicer, and more appealing office space in one of the city's high-rise buildings. Eagleton agreed. Julie picked up the space, signed the lease, and sent it off to Houston. But by the time Eagleton received it, Julie would be gone. On Wednesday, August 27th, Julie left her home in Marion and made the 120-mile trip out to Des Moines, where she was gathering and packing materials for the move, which was set to occur the following week. After a long day, she made the two-hour drive back. On the morning of Thursday, August 28th, Julie woke in the morning and headed into work at the Cedar Rapids office. The plan was to work for a few hours in the morning and then head back out to Des Moines. According to the official timeline, Julie was in the Cedar Rapids office for only a few hours that day. It's been stated that she arrived in Des Moines at approximately 12 p.m., which would have her leaving Cedar Rapids sometime between 9.45 and 10. By all accounts, she was in a good mood that morning and gave no indication that there were any issues. One curious aspect of her travels that day may be the timing. That week, Julie had been going out to Des Moines after working long hours in Cedar Rapids, but on this morning, she left before noon, leading some to wonder if perhaps, in addition to packing, she may have had an appointment. When asked by the Gazette, Eagleton stated that he wasn't sure whether or not Julie had any meetings that day. If in the years since that has been established one way or the other, that information has never been revealed. The last time Julie was confirmed to be alive, was just an hour and a half after her arrival. According to investigators, she made a call from the satellite office back to the Cedar Rapids office at approximately 1.30. At this time, Julie spoke with at least one of her co-workers in the office, though some reports say she was on a conference call. Either way, according to those she spoke with, she was in good spirits and gave no indication that she was concerned, worried, or had any issues at the Des Moines satellite office. The next time anyone saw Julie, it would be the discovery of her body at approximately 7 p.m. What exactly occurred between 1.30 and 7 remains a mystery, though investigators will go on to make certain determinations. This is where things become a little confusing. We know that someone showed up at the satellite office that night, found the back security door open, walked inside, and made the horrifying discovery. What we don't know is, who exactly that person was. In early news reports, this person was referred to as a passerby, someone who just happened to be in the area, saw the door, and decided to check it out. However, in a 2010 interview with WHO News 13, former lead investigator Craig Hamilton of the Des Moines Police Department explained that this was not just some random passerby, but someone Julie knew. Hamilton explained, quote, When we did arrive at the scene, there was an acquaintance of Julie's there. This individual was also interviewed, and nothing came out of that. End quote. This acquaintance arrived at the business park at approximately 7 p.m., apparently to visit Julie. Upon noticing the rear door was left partially open, he walked inside and in a rear storage room found Julie lying on the concrete floor. It was obvious to this person that Julie had been killed, and he quickly called the Des Moines police, who arrived on the scene in minutes. There were a few things police noted before even walking inside the building, which made them feel that this was not just another random crime. Amongst the tenants of the River Hills Business Park, just a few doors down from where Julie was killed, were the offices for the Iowa State Police's Accident Investigation Unit as well as the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. To investigators, this suggested either the killer was completely unaware or knew about the potential law enforcement presence, but committed the murder anyway. It's quite a risk for the killer to take. Had Julie screamed out, it's likely one of the police officers nearby would have heard it. Even if she didn't, there was always the chance a police officer could have seen the killer and the vehicle he was driving which would make the chances of being caught much greater. Kathy Leonard, 
who worked out of an office nearby, explained to the Des Moines Register, quote, There's usually three or four state patrol cars parked down there. You think it would be safe. End quote. On this particular night, though, no one in the business park seems to have heard anything out of the ordinary. Some people spoke with police and said they had seen, quote, suspicious people in the parking lot, end quote, but any details about them or what exactly made them suspicious has never been made clear. As investigators entered the building, they proceeded into the back room where Julie's body was found. It was immediately clear to police that Julie had been stabbed multiple times. In several different accounts of the scene, the detail which investigators have noted over and over again is the massive quantity of blood. For a time, police believed the amount of blood at the scene would almost guarantee they'd be able to find some sign of the perpetrator, be it bloody fingerprints or footprints. However, when the results of the forensic analysis of the crime scene came in, they were disappointed to discover that the killer had left behind absolutely no trace. There were no fingerprints, no footprints, no hairs or fibers, and they had swept everything, including the large glass windows and doors, which typically hold on to prints until they're cleaned. The question became, had the killer simply not touched anything, had he cleaned up after himself, or was he wearing gloves? In terms of a motive, police came up short there as well. There didn't appear to be any sign of sexual assault, and that was later confirmed in the autopsy. Police initially considered robbery, but the evidence just wasn't there. Julie was wearing jewelry at the time she was killed, but there'd been no attempt to remove it from her. The office itself wasn't packed with valuable items. In fact, Eagleton later told the Gazette the only items of value in the office were a telephone and a fax machine, neither of which was touched. Cash wasn't kept on site, as Julie's brother Christopher explained, quote, there was never any money there or anything where she worked. Just absolutely no motive or reason why. It's just terrible. We're in shock. End quote. Investigators also noted that there was no sign of forced entry and a startling lack of clues to explain either who had been responsible or why the crime had been committed in the first place. Very early on, Police were aware that this case had a lot of questions and very few answers, and they tried to prepare both Julie's family and the public for just how difficult of an investigation it would be. Des Moines Police Sergeant Bruce Elrod tried to set the expectations low, telling the Gazette, quote, Right now, investigators are following up on what information is available, but that is indeed slim. There's going to be a very slow-moving investigation. It's going to be a very difficult case due to the lack of evidence. End quote. To this day, the Des Moines police remain extremely tight lipped about the investigation. One detail they have revealed, however, is that Julie did not go quietly. As Sergeant Elrod explained, quote, There were some signs that she put up a struggle, but I can't get into a lot of details on that. End quote. While very little information about the crime scene has ever been revealed, investigators did later state that the murder weapon had not been recovered and the killer had likely taken it with him. While the exact type of weapon used has never been revealed, Polk County Medical Examiner Francis Garrity did tell the Gazette that they were able to determine what type of weapon it was based on the wounds, though he wouldn't go into details, leaving that decision to the police. Garrity also would not discuss how many wounds there had been, and at the time it was explained that Julie had died as the result of stab wounds to her chest. When asked why they had told the public so little about the crime, Lieutenant Kelly Willis of the Des Moines Police explained, quote, We're being very sketchy because there are certain things only certain people know, obviously the bad guy. We don't want to play our hand completely. It's definitely a case where it will hinder our investigation if we tell too much. End quote. What had initially been considered a possible random crime was slowly changing shape in the minds of police, and within days of Julie's murder, they were following a theory that Julie herself may have been specifically targeted by the killer. Julie's family was absolutely devastated when they learned of her murder. Her brother, 
Parents and husband were left shocked and reeling, unsure of why it had happened or who could have been responsible. Investigators from Des Moines traveled out to Cedar Rapids to interview family and friends. They went to the Cedar Rapids office and went through Julie's belongings, most specifically targeting her address book and calendar. They wanted to speak with anyone who had seen, spoken to, or done business with Julie in the months leading up to her death. Unfortunately, in their quest to find someone, anyone who may have had a motive to see Julie killed, they weren't coming up with much, if anything. In hopes of getting some kind of leads, investigators turned to the public. A $2,000 reward for information was offered, and police asked the public to come forward with anything they might know. Lieutenant Willis made a statement to the Des Moines Register, explaining, quote, This is going to be a real tough homicide for us to follow up on. At this point, we're hitting some dead ends, so we're asking for the public's help. If anyone remembers seeing a car in that area on that afternoon or morning, please let us know, end quote. All police had to go on at the time was their belief that Julie had been targeted and the possibility that she may have known her killer. This was attributed to the lack of any screams being heard, despite the signs of a struggle, as well as the fact that the killer had gained access to the office. Since there was an automatically locking door, Investigators theorized Julie may have let the suspect in and perhaps may have recognized or been familiar with him. Five days after the murder, more than 500 people attended Julie's funeral in Cedar Rapids. Her mother, Joanne, read a letter from one of Julie's previous employers who explained how hardworking and brilliant she was, noting her dedication to her job was superseded only by her devotion to her husband and children. Members of the Cedar Rapids Fire Department, Frank's co-workers, were on hand for the service. Reverend Gary Nim spoke of the pain of losing Julie, but reminded those in attendance to remember Julie as she had lived, full of life and love, and to note their grief as an indicator of just how much she had meant to all of them. Julie was later laid to rest in Cedar Memorial Park Cemetery. On the same day as Julie's family struggled to say goodbye to their beloved daughter, sister, wife, and mother, the Des Moines police were expressing their own frustrations over the state of the investigation. They described it as stifling. Lieutenant Willis, when speaking to the Gazette, explained the bleak outlook, saying, quote, This is a real whodunit, if you will. The reality is that right now, we need help. We're not real optimistic. That doesn't say we're going to give up on it, though. End quote. Early on, police questioned dozens of individuals but simply couldn't find anyone to tie to the murder. Julie's husband was ruled out very early, and the more investigators looked at the people in Julie's life, the less it seemed that any of them had either the motive, means, or opportunity. Within a week of the murder, investigators publicly stated that after having ruled everything else out, all they were left with was that Julie was in fact targeted and likely by someone who was no novice. While they would not release details, police did say they believed Julie's killer knew what he was doing and had taken steps to cover up his or her tracks. It was revealed, though, that investigators believed the murder had likely taken place between the hours of 3 and 6 p.m. While at that time, police did not have many directions to look, over the course of the next year, a series of murders would begin to draw questions about the possibility that a serial killer might be stalking for victims in the area. The first of those murders occurred on Thursday, September 4th, exactly one week after Julie had been killed. Ten miles to the west in the city of Clive, 21-year-old Zarietta Sakonovic was found dead in room 309 of the Budgetel Inn, where she worked as a housekeeper. Sakonovic, a Bosnian refugee, had arrived for her shift between 8 and 8.30 a.m., according to the register. Police were called just two hours later at 10.20. While police did not determine the exact time of death early on, they were able to confirm the cause. Sakonovic had been stabbed multiple times in the chest. According to the Des Moines police at the time, they didn't believe there was a link between Julie's murder and that of Sakonovic. While the methods admit similar, investigators felt that there were differences too. 
In October, Sergeant Bruce Elrod spoke with the Gazette and explained that despite the diligence of their investigation, they had not developed any solid leads in Julie's case. Elrod explained, quote, There's no smoking gun on this one. It's going to take a lucky break or some piece of information that somebody's going to let us know to lead us to the suspect, and that hasn't been received yet. End quote. In terms of potential suspects, Elrod noted that no one had yet been ruled out or in, and that the investigation was still very much open and active. By this point, the reward for information in Julie's case had risen to $6,000. On Wednesday, October 8th, a month and a half after Julie had been killed and less than 15 miles to the south, the body of 42-year-old Arliss Ponce was discovered in her home in Norwalk. Ponce had been beaten and stabbed to death. This was the third stabbing murder of a woman in the area in less than 60 days. When discussing the three stabbing homicides with the Gazette, Division of Criminal Investigation spokesman John Blessman explained that they did not see any solid connection between the three cases, outside of the fact that all three victims had been killed by someone wielding a knife. Blessman stated, quote, Obviously, we entertain every idea. At this point, there's absolutely nothing that would link them. End quote. Just a little over a week later, Lieutenant Willis was asked about progress on Julie's case. His reply was less than comforting as he explained, quote, We have pretty much come to a standstill. End quote. Over the course of the next few months, there would be a lot of debate in the media about possible connections between the three homicides and the potential that there might be a serial killer, though police were dismissive of the idea. On December 31st, New Year's Eve, Julie would have turned 34 years old. Her family placed a memorial post for her in the paper that day, as they would every year for the next decade. Less than a month into 1998, on Friday, January 23rd, just over halfway between the River Hills Business Park where Julie had been killed and the Budgetel Inn where Sakonovic was murdered, police found the body of Mariana Redrobin at the West Des Moines Walnut Creek Inn. Redrobin, a 15-year-old immigrant from Ecuador, was working as a housekeeper at the inn when she was brutally stabbed to death. At the time, Investigators acknowledged they were looking for a potential link between the murders of Red Robin and Sakonovic, primarily because they both worked as housekeepers in hotels and were both immigrants. In terms of a link between all four crimes, police were less willing to commit, though when Sergeant Joseph Torella of the West Des Moines Police was asked about a serial killer, he would neither confirm nor deny but he did tell people in the area that they needed to be more defensive and vigilant. Discussion of Sakonovic and Red Robin's murder brought up memories of an unsolved homicide from 1993. Patricia Lang had been found dead in her hotel room at the University Park Holiday Inn in West Des Moines, less than one mile from where Sakonovic was killed four years later. In the Muscatine Journal, it was revealed that, aside from the proximity, the three women's murders shared other traits. All three were found with their wrists bound. All three were nude from the waist down. While public pressure was building to acknowledge the similarities and the likelihood that a serial killer was active, police would not yet state that they agreed, noting that while there were similarities in the three cases, there were vast differences when it came to the murders of Julie Davis and Arliss Ponce. Unfortunately, all cases, including Julie's, were growing cold. One year after Julie was killed, on August 28, 1998, the Gazette spoke with Sergeant Elrod about the status of her case, but little progress had been made. In terms of a connection between Julie's murder and the other murders, Elrod acknowledged it had been discussed, but they'd not been able to find any solid evidence to make a link. In regard to suspects, Elrod declined to comment. In conclusion, Elrod explained, quote, It's open. It remains open, and there's always the possibility that something's going to come up. End quote. Julie's case would continue growing cold as the years passed. 
But in January of 2000, an arrest was finally made in the 1993 murder of Patricia Lang, and that opened the door for investigators to begin considering that suspect in the other murders. On Friday the 21st, 38-year-old Donald Arthur Piper was officially charged with the murder of Patricia Lang. Investigators acknowledged that they had received tips about his involvement as early as December of 1993, but they didn't have the evidence they needed. New advances in technology allowed them to run tests which conclusively linked Piper to the scene of Lang's murder. Piper had worked as the hotel's maintenance chief, though he quit two months prior to Lang's death even though he was seen hanging around in employee-only areas after that. As part of his job, he had access to master keys, which would grant him entrance to any room. In August of 2001, Piper was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. While his lawyer told the media they were already working on an appeal, Piper would also face a second trial in October where he was being charged with the 1997 murder of Zurieta Sakonovic. In June of 2002, Piper was found guilty of Sakonovic's murder. The main piece of evidence which linked Piper to the crime was a drop of blood recovered from sheets on the bed. DNA analysis linked that blood to Piper. This was his second conviction for first-degree murder and carried the same sentence, life without parole. While the prosecution was getting everything lined up for both cases, the Des Moines police organized a task force which would examine several unsolved homicides for potential links to Piper, among which was the stabbing death of Julie Davis. When speaking with the Des Moines Register, Lieutenant Rick Singleton acknowledged that they had looked at approximately 12 suspects in Julie's murder, and he noted Donald Piper was one of them. Singleton, while he would not expand on Piper or any other suspects, did tell the register that they had a pretty good idea, saying, quote, I think we know who we're looking at as to who may be responsible for it, but we're not able to prove it, so the case remains open, end quote. Unfortunately, even if investigators believe they know who killed Julie over the past 24 years, they have never given a name, nor have they made an arrest. After Piper's double convictions, Julie's case once again went cold. In 2010, WHO TV News 13 aired a cold case segment discussing Julie's murder. During the segment, they returned to the scene of the crime and showed what the area looked like. They also managed to get an interview with Craig Hamilton, formerly of the Des Moines Police, who had been the lead investigator on Julie's case. It was during this interview that several new details were revealed. Hamilton explained that while Julie had in fact been stabbed multiple times in the chest, her killer had also cut her throat. When asked how he believed the crime had occurred, Hamilton presented a scenario, saying, quote, Looks like the perpetrator of the crime came up behind her, grabbed a hold of her hair, and pulled her head back and cut her throat. Prior to her falling, she was stabbed several times in the chest area. End quote. Hamilton noted that this was an up close and personal murder and that whoever had committed it knew what they were doing and knew how to cover their tracks. As far as Hamilton was concerned, the crime had all the hallmarks of having been carried out by a professional, someone who was either an experienced killer or perhaps who killed on a contract basis. He explained to WHO TV, quote, very unusual. It seems like it was the kind of a professional hit to a certain extent. You could say they did their homework, end quote. This year will mark 24 years since Julie Davis was murdered in cold blood. Her killer, for all of this time, has managed to elude the police, the startling lack of evidence at the scene having left investigators with nothing to work with. While Donald Piper has remained a suspect in Julie's death, there's never been anything produced to make a solid connection. While some believe Piper was responsible, others feel that there are too many differences. Both Patricia Lang and Zurieta Sakonovic were killed in hotels. Both were found with their wrists bound, and both were nude from the waist down. However, 
Lang had been strangled to death with two ligatures, while Sakonovic had been strangled, but ultimately stabbed to death. In the case of 15-year-old Mariana Redroban, Piper is still considered a suspect, though he's never been charged. Mariana's case remains open and unsolved, as does the stabbing murder of Arliss Ponce, in which Piper is also a suspect. While police felt Piper could be connected to both murders, Redroban because of the crime scene being at a hotel, and Ponce allegedly because of a call Piper may have made to the victim in the days leading up to her murder, they've never managed to come up with anything which could connect Piper to Julie. As far as they know, she never saw Piper, and they haven't been able to come up with a situation in which he may have seen her. And while that doesn't exclude him from consideration, it doesn't include him either. Julie Davis was just 33 years old when she was killed on August 28, 1997. If alive today, she would be turning 58. In the last 24 years, a lot has changed. The River Hills Business Park is gone, leveled and replaced with soaring high-rise apartments. Her children, then just three and five, are now in their late 20s and early 30s. They've had to move forward with their lives absent of the ability to grow up with the mother who loved them so dearly. In May of 2017, Julie's father Robert passed away at the age of 84, never knowing who took his only daughter, never having the chance to see justice served. Julie's family has always remained rather quiet and withdrawn, choosing not to discuss her case publicly outside of a few quotes to local newspapers. However, every year for more than a decade, on both her birthday and the anniversary of her murder, they would place a photo of Julie in the newspaper's memorial section with a statement of how much she was missed. One of those memorials read, quote, For every minute, hour, day, and year that passes, we wish you were here. In our hearts, Julie, we will always hold you near. Thoughts of you and fond memories are always in our mind. The words to tell you how much we miss you are so very hard to find. The pain, anguish, and helplessness we feel seems never-ending, but all of our love to you we are forever sending. We feel your presence in the joy of the two new babies born to our family this year, for remembering the great aunt you would have been the great daughter, sister, mother, and friend you were, we have no fear, for you are here. The murder of Julie Bell Davis is an extremely difficult, tragic, and frustrating case. A bright, loving, talented young mother is moving up in her career, making big deals, and getting ready to move into a nicer office when she's needlessly killed in a violent and brutal fashion. From nearly the first moment investigators knew they were dealing with something that was going to be difficult to work, and 24 years later the investigation remains open. Despite solving two murders, including one which occurred just a week later and shared similarities to Julie's, they've never managed to tie this crime to anyone. There hasn't been a lot of coverage of this case. Newspapers dedicated a lot of pages to Julie's murder early on, but as the years began passing, it became less and less. Between 2003 and 2016, there were only two articles and one news segment. In the years since, there's been nothing. No comments from investigators, no updates, no anything. The last real information we have is that police have someone in mind, but couldn't find any evidence to make a connection. Even having that statement, there appears to be some dispute amongst those who would work the case in terms of a potential suspect. Due to the lack of coverage, there aren't a lot of theories out there. There's not a lot of discussion about this case, but what discussion has happened seems to revolve around three possible scenarios. Some people believe this crime may in fact have been random, committed by someone who had perhaps seen Julie in the office in the weeks leading up to her murder and decided to plan it out. Others argue that the crime was likely tied to Donald Piper, noting the similarities to the crimes he's been convicted of and their proximity to Julie. Finally, there are those who believe this crime was planned out and executed by someone Julie knew, either directly or perhaps through the use of a paid hitman. 
So we'll start at the top, looking at the possibility that this was random and committed by someone who has never been considered or even named. There's a handful of reasons why investigators don't think it was random. Firstly, the absence of a real motive. Since there was no robbery and no sexual assault, it seemed unlikely that someone had merely selected Julie for no particular reason, perhaps other than one known by the killer. At that time, the business park was in a relatively safe area with low crime, and a business park isn't generally the type of place a random killer is going to be hanging out. While there's a lot of people coming and going, that also means there's a high potential for someone to see the killer in the area. One of the more compelling factors may have been the police presence. The Iowa State Police and the Division of Criminal Investigation were using office space just a few doors down from where Julie was killed. As was pointed out by people who worked in the complex, there were often state patrol vehicles parked behind the building, and authorities felt that a killer, even if he saw Julie alone, wasn't likely to strike so close to police while risking the chance that she could have screamed or run and gotten the attention of those officers. According to several studies on the subject, female victims are targeted by people they know two times as often as they are targeted by total strangers. Stats like those, coupled with the nature of the crime, lead you to the same conclusion, that Julie must have known her killer. One detail I've seen mentioned several times is that the door the killer entered through had to be open from the inside. It was a security door, which would automatically lock when it shut, and so it was argued that Julie had to let her killer in. However, when the acquaintance arrived that night, he found the door ajar, which seems to imply that the door wasn't great at automatically closing. Beyond that, we do have to consider that Julie was packing up the office. Is it possible she could have propped the door open to make it easier to transport items out of the building? Surely. And if that was the case, then Julie didn't have to open the door for anyone. So sure, this could have been a random crime committed by a complete stranger, a predator who saw an opportunity and seized upon it, someone who was out looking for a target and saw Julie alone in the office. It's probably not the most likely scenario, but it can't be completely ruled out with what we know about this crime. Simply because someone may have been a stranger to Julie, though, does not mean that she was a stranger to them. It's not impossible to imagine Julie could have been around town a bit, either going for something to eat, doing business, or maybe when she was shopping around for new office space. Anyone could have seen her at any time when she was in Des Moines, stalked her, made notes of her comings and goings, and the fact that she was primarily alone there. That takes us in the direction mentioned by Craig Hamilton, the possibility of a murder for hire. Being that the suspect left behind no clues, apparently knew how to clean up after himself, and committed this crime quickly and quietly, there's a certain level of belief that the killer could have been a professional. If indeed someone was hired to kill Julie, that person would likely have been following her, taking notes, keeping track of her comings and goings, and trying to narrow down both a time and location that would provide the most accessibility and the least chance of being caught. I know one detail police have mentioned to suggest that it had to be someone Julie knew was that there were no screams, but we also know that her throat was cut, and that being the case, she simply may not have been able to scream. If you're going to look at a professional hit, then you're going to eventually ask who would have wanted Julie dead so badly that they would pay out a contract. Well, that's a question we'll have to look at later when we examine the theory of Julie knowing the person responsible for her murder. While a lot of people have ruled out a stranger possibility or even a hitman, I think there's something we can't really ignore, and that's Donald Piper. Piper, later convicted of two murders, didn't know the victims before he struck either. And that leads us into our second theory. It can be difficult to imagine someone else could have been responsible when you see Piper and the similarities between the crimes. Both of the women Piper is convicted of having killed, Patricia Lang and Zurieta Sakonovic, were surprised by Piper and had little time to resist. Sakonovic was killed just 10 miles to the west of the business park a week after Julie. Patricia Lang was killed four years earlier, nine miles to the west. There was less than one mile between the murder sites of Lang and Sakonovic. Mariana Redrobon, whose murder remains unsolved but for which Piper is a suspect, 
was killed nearly halfway between the sites of Sakonovic and Julie's deaths. It's hard to dismiss those details as mere coincidence, but many people believe that's exactly what it is, and that's because for everything the crimes share, there are specific angles in which they differ. Piper had a pretty particular way he went about his crimes. His victims were found with their wrists bound, taped in the case of Sakonovic, and a torn pillowcase with Lang. Their clothing had been removed from the waist down and discarded next to them. Lang was strangled to death through the use of at least two ligatures, while Sakonovic was both strangled and stabbed multiple times in the chest, with the stabs being listed as her cause of death. In the case of Mariana Redrobon, it's never been revealed if she was strangled, but we do know she was stabbed. All three of these murders occurred in hotels, and Lang was killed in a hotel that Piper had previously worked in. It seems hotels were the kinds of places Piper selected to target his victims. When it came to actually carrying out the crimes, they were handled very similarly. Piper has only ever agreed to a single interview during his time in prison, and in that interview he gave seven tips for hotel guests to help protect themselves. Some of those tips, in a way, may show you the methodology Piper used to select his victims. The ones which caught my eye were, never leave your hotel key in view if it has the room number or hotel name on it, never prop your door open for any reason, and when you're checking in, request that the clerk not say your room number out loud. Easily, you can see how Piper could have gotten room numbers, either from seeing someone's key or just being in the lobby when they were checking in. Oftentimes, when housekeepers were working in rooms, they leave the door propped open, and maybe that could explain how he was able to get in and get at Sakonovic. Julie's case is different, though. Yes, she's stabbed, but we also know she had her throat cut. In fact, if former investigator Hamilton is correct, that may have been the first thing her killer did. According to all reports, when Julie was found, she was fully dressed and showed no indication that anything sexual had occurred. Both of Piper's confirmed victims, though, were partially nude, and there was some evidence of sexual assault, or at least the staging of the scene to appear as though there had been. Julie wasn't bound in any way, nor was she strangled, which seems to be a key facet of Piper's murders. Even if it's not the only way in which he commits murder, it somehow fits into the fantasy that he's enacting. Piper didn't rob his victims. In fact, the case of Patricia Lang, her briefcase was found open nearby and her wallet had over $200 in it, but Piper made no attempts to remove it or anything else from the room. That matches up with Julie, as nothing was taken from her either. But again, beyond the use of a knife, we don't have much to connect Piper. His first murder was done in a hotel where he had worked, one where he was familiar with the processes and comfortable with the environment. His second was in a hotel again, going back to what he knows and what he's familiar with. If Mariana was one of his victims, she too would fit into this set of requirements. Julie doesn't. She's in an office complex, not far from police. The killer would likely have had to have known she was there, known the way in, and known she was alone. This has led many to believe Julie may have been killed by someone she knew, and that leads us into our final theory. There are several different factors which have been listed as to why it's believed Julie could have known her killer. The fact that the crime was up close and personal, that it seems to be specifically targeted against her with no motive, that the killer likely not only knew that Julie would be there that night, but that she was by herself. While it's been said she had to have let her killer in, I'm not sure that that's true, based on the discussion we had earlier about the door. If Hamilton is correct and the killer came up behind Julie, pulled her hair, and immediately cut her throat, that would explain the absence of screams, but could also suggest Julie could have known the person and felt comfortable enough to turn her back on them. I think the idea of her knowing her killer comes out of a combination of several of those reasons, plus the statistics about female murder victims, and ultimately, that Julie was not in Des Moines very often, had been there the day before, and on a normal schedule, would not have been back there that night. In one particular article, the brother of a different murder victim from years earlier told reporters he had discussed the differences between his sister's case and Julie's case. 
One of the differences he claimed investigators noted was that while his sister didn't really know anyone in Des Moines, Julie had several people she knew there. The implication seems to be that these were business relations, people she had either worked with, pitched deals to, or encountered somehow through her business out of the satellite office. The acquaintance knew she would be there that night. Who else might have? I think another angle that's never really been talked about is the money aspect of this case. We know Julie had put up amazing numbers, having her best month to that point in time. In order to do that, she would have had to have made a lot of different sales to different companies. Working in sales, there's a lot of competition, and there's definitely people out there who become angry when someone scoops an account from them. Whether or not that means angry enough to kill is anyone's guess, but let's face it, we've seen people killed for barely any money. And if we're talking about numbers in the tens of thousands here, there's a good chance someone could have seen that as reason enough. I think that divides the field into two sections. Co-workers who could have been jealous and competitors who could have felt slighted. Both are arguably possible, although co-workers were more likely to have known where Julie would be that night, especially since her last phone call was back to the office. According to everything we know, she only worked with four other full-time people in the main office and one part-time employee. That doesn't leave a very large pool of suspects, and it's fairly safe to believe police dug into all those people's lives, personal and financial, to try and find any possible connections. The fact is, if anyone threw up any kind of red flag, we've never been made aware of it. In terms of competitors, I'm not even sure where you'd begin. How many salespeople were working in the area and could have been competing with Julie for accounts? How many other companies were working in the same field and how many of those companies had accounts that switched sides or overlapped with Skyline displays? These are all interesting questions to ask, but we don't have any of the answers. Due to that, it's difficult to dig into what others might have done or what might be possible without just speculating other than to say it's certainly possible Julie could have been killed over money. If we move out of the office, then we're looking at Julie's personal life, and there, we don't have much information either. By all accounts, Julie was either at work or at home with her family. She didn't go out, she didn't spend extravagantly, she wasn't going to parties and meeting people all the time. She was very dedicated to her job, and even more so to her husband and children. Her husband, Frank, was ruled out very early in the investigation. He was back in Cedar Rapids when the crime occurred. He was crushed by the loss of his wife and didn't have any idea who could possibly have wanted to kill Julie. So all anyone could really do is speculate. Could it have been someone who was interested in Julie and felt spurned by her dismissal of their approach? Could it have come down to jealousy? Someone who wanted something Julie had or for some reason wanted to see her or her family hurt? Anything is really possible, but throughout the investigation, there doesn't seem to be any one particular person in Julie's life who really set off alarm bells. As far as we know, there's no one who was questioned multiple times, no one who was asked to take a polygraph or submit any kind of DNA sample. It seems apparent that Julie's life in Cedar Rapids was connected by family and close friends. Her time in Des Moines is more of a mystery. I'd really like to know who the acquaintance was who found her that night. Why was he or she there? The absence of any information on that person is very frustrating, even if police say they interviewed them thoroughly. Being that police knew the call Julie made to the office that afternoon was her last seems to suggest they pulled the phone records. If she had called anyone else, if anyone had called her, they'd know about it, but that doesn't appear to have happened. As far as we've been made aware, Julie didn't have any appointments scheduled that day, so there wasn't anyone coming to the office to talk about a deal. She was packing, and when she was killed, she was in the rear storage room, which seems to lend credence to the likelihood that she had no one scheduled. Not to mention, even if she had, it likely would have been for earlier in the day since she got there at noon and was likely killed between 3 and 6. So could Julie's killer have known her? Could it have been someone she trusted, someone she worked with, someone she'd befriended, or someone who saw her as business competition? Absolutely. 
Unfortunately, like so much of this case, we don't have enough evidence to really make any solid connections. No fingerprints, footprints, DNA, fibers, hairs, witness sightings, nothing. Whoever committed this horrible crime knew what they were doing, knew how to cover their tracks, and knew how to get away with it for nearly 24 years. And that's exactly what they've done. It was almost a cold case from day one. Police knew it wasn't going to be easy. And all these years later, we don't appear to be any closer to the truth. Sadly, without new evidence, new leads or tips, the murder of Julie Bell Davis will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Julie Bell Davis, there are some archive news articles, though they're mostly from the first year. You could also visit iowacoldcases.org, which has information about Julie's case as well as all the other cases mentioned in this episode. If you have any information about the murder of Julie Bell Davis, please contact the Des Moines Police Department at 515 515- 283-4800. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Trace Evidence would not be possible without the support of amazing listeners like you. Now I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dearthy, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, James, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kevin Bonham, Marla Wright, Melissa Breckeisen, Michael Draves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Roberta Jansen, Quinn McBreen, Sarah Levenin, Sarah Mascaritolo, Travis Sepsko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable and your support of the show is both appreciated and humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, getting cool merch, and having access to commercial-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence. That concludes this episode of Trace Evidence. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence. Trace Evidence.